I've shared in previous episodes about the fact that I grew up in a political household, but even though I've always had an interest in politics, what pushed me over the edge to choosing political science as a major in college was something else. My first year at The Ohio State University, yeah, I said it, The Ohio State University, I took an honors intro course on international politics with Professor Ted Huff. His area of expertise was on Russia, both during and after the time of the Soviet Union. His stories about spending time in Russia were worth listening to, even though I confess that sometimes I would fall asleep in his class, as I did in all my other classes, but it wasn't due to boredom. Kids, don't neglect your health. I remember him telling me how it amazed him that I could fall asleep sitting straight up. Anyway, a couple of years later, I took his advanced level course on Soviet and post-Soviet foreign policy, which was also quite wonderful. I absolutely loved that course and Dr. Huff's teaching style. His stories were very fascinating. It was amazing to what extent modern political history was influenced by the Cold War, from the Vietnam War, to apartheid in South Africa, to the rise of Al-Qaeda in the War on Terror. One of the aspects of the Soviet Union that I learned about, that I always found intriguing, is the lengths the Soviet Union would go to to craft a certain narrative for their people and hide the truth, which was especially evident while the country was under the regime of Joseph Stalin. Stalin was one of the inspirations for the dystopian classic 1984 by George Orwell, which, by the way, is my favorite novel. For a research paper, I once read a book published in the Soviet Union during the time of Stalin. It was recounting the history of the first and second five-year plans designed to propel the Soviet Union forward in a short period of time, including the modernization of industry, transportation, and communications. But of course, the book didn't mention the resistance of individual farmers to the collectivization of farms, or the Great Famine that accompanied the first five-year plan that killed up to 7 million people. The book also failed to note that part of the second five-year plan included closing all houses of worship and eliminating clergy, which they were able to do successfully. Not only did the Soviets manipulate reality using the written word, they also did Photoshop before Photoshop. Well, not exactly Photoshop, but they were skilled at airbrushing people out of photos who were disappeared by the government. An instance of this that struck me the most for some reason was a photo of Nikolai Yezov. Between 1936 and 1953, the communist government under Stalin engaged in a series of purges. On its face, this meant you were kicked out of the Communist Party. But in reality, the purges meant arrest, imprisonment, and often execution. Yezov was the leader of the NKVD, precursor to the KGB, during the Great Purge, the largest of the purges between 1936 and 1938. The height of the Great Purge, which was around 1937 and 1938, took the lives of about 1.2 million people. Apparently, Yezov relished his role, which involved orchestrating the purge, so he was nicknamed the Bloody Dwarf. Eventually, he fell out of favor with Stalin and was executed in the purges himself in 1940 in a cellar of an NKVD station with a sloping floor to easily wash away blood that he himself designed. Well, there's a famous picture of Yezov standing on a deck next to a body of water. He's this short guy, of course, because he's the bloody dwarf, standing next to Stalin and a couple other officials. After his death, the government airbrushed him out as if he never existed at all. And for the 1940s, they did a pretty convincing job. A lot better than some of the stuff you see done through Photoshop today. Even though the Soviet Union is no more, the Helsinki summit in its aftermath should tell us that the efforts of Russia and now our compromised president following their lead to misinform and straight up lie to the public is just as strong as ever. I am your host, Jay Poole. And this is Potstirer Podcast. On July 16th, Donald Trump met with Russian President Vladimir Putin 
in Helsinki, Finland, and engaged in a two-hour conversation with each other with no one but themselves and interpreters. This is what he said at the end of it. President Putin denied having anything to do with the election interference in 2016. Every U.S. intelligence agency has concluded that Russia did. Who do you believe? My people came to me, Dan Coates came to me and some others. They said they think it's Russia. Uh, I have uh, President Putin. Uh, he just said it's not Russia. I will say this. I don't see any reason why it would be. I have great confidence in my intelligence people, but uh, I will tell you that President Putin was extremely strong and powerful in his denial today. Afterwards, Trump attempted to retcon his statement with... It should have been obvious. I thought it would be obvious, but I would like to clarify just in case it wasn't. In a key sentence in my remarks, I said the word would instead of wouldn't. The sentence should have been, I don't see any reason why I wouldn't or why it wouldn't be Russia. But if you pay attention to the entire context of his original statement, his initial statement clearly fits better than the latter one does. But I'm sure his hope is that some people would believe him. And of course, his stands do. But the rest of us see something else. During the post-talk press conference, Putin was asked by Reuters reporter Jeff Mason, President Putin, did you want President Trump to win the election? And did you direct any of your officials to help him do that? Putin responds, Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Because he talked about bringing the U.S.-Russia relationship back to normal. But in the initial White House transcripts, the first part of Mason's comment was cut off. It was also cut off in the initial video from the White House, and it made it appear as if the second part was tied to an earlier question posed about the Mueller investigation. After an outcry from the news media, Thursday, the White House changed the transcript to reflect Mason's entire question, stating that the omission in both the transcript and the video stems from the audio mixer not being turned up in time for the first part of the question. It's up to you if you believe them. Stateside, there is so much going on regarding the Russian investigation that it's hard to cover completely and things change, it seems, like every day. Former Trump campaign chair Paul Manafort is about to go on trial for fraud. Also, the indictment of 12 Russian intelligence officers by special counsel Robert Mueller is a big development. Then... The arrest of Maria Butina, another alleged Russian spy, opens up another can of worms as she has ties to the National Rifle Association or the NRA. I mentioned in the YouTube exclusive I posted last year on Philando Castile that the NRA is no longer a gun rights advocacy group, but an arm for Trump and alt-right policies that go beyond Second Amendment lobbying. Well, according to OpenSecrets.org, the NRA spent $11.5 million in support of Trump and almost $20 million to oppose Hillary Clinton in 2016. But there's always been a question as to where this $30 plus million came from. The NRA initially said that they only received one contribution from a member with Russian ties in the last six years. But in April, they admitted they received 23 Russian-related contributions since 2015. Now, here's the thing. Lobbying organizations are allowed to receive donations from foreign governments, but it is illegal for political campaigns to accept contributions from foreign nationals or foreign governments. Well, apparently, Mueller and his team are investigating possible money laundering involving the NRA. They are suspected of allegedly funneling money from Russian oligarchs and Russian officials to the Trump campaign. So there's really a lot going on here, and the investigation is ongoing. Remember, Bill Clinton's impeachment was the result of a special prosecutor investigation that took four and a half years. It started with the investigation of a land deal involving the Clintons, and later led to the Monica Lewinsky scandal, which led to the impeachment. So just because Trump is not in jail right now doesn't mean we should pull the plug on the Mueller investigation. These things take time. But with all these issues going on right now, Trump says this, quote, just stick with us. Don't believe the crap you see from these people, the fake news, unquote. I think a huge part of the challenge of Trump when talking about him, his ethics issues, 
and his policies with other people, especially those who support him, is that he has pushed this narrative that what the media has said about him isn't true, what others say about him isn't true, what is in the public record about him isn't true, but what he says is true, even if he contradicts himself. Who are you going to believe? Me or your lying eyes? And see, that's the danger. If not all of us are willing to acknowledge facts, even when they are in front of our faces, then what is the hope of keeping Trump accountable for his actions? In light of this, I've seen a number of people lately, including self-proclaimed liberals, saying that progressives are going about the opposition to Trump all wrong. For example, former Democratic strategist Ted Van Dyke recently wrote an opinion piece for the Wall Street Journal stating that by Democrats calling Trump a traitor, bringing up his ties to Russia, and engaging in what he called identity politics, or in other words, civil rights, they are pushing voters right into Trump's arms and they will lose in 2020. Besides the fact that with knowing who Trump is and has always been, people who vote for him are solely responsible for their vote and all the uncomfortable implications that come along with it, The idea that if only Democrats ignore reality, they will win in 2020 is asinine. Over the past 25 years, the Democrats have acquiesced to the conservative narrative and has resulted in a Republican majority in all branches of federal government and in most states, thanks to an eroded Democratic voting base aided with gerrymandering and voter suppression. We as a country are in the position we are right now because of ridiculous, wrong, weak-willed advice like that. The Democrats have been run by the third way for a generation now. We did it their way, and their way clearly didn't work. And in the long run, if Democrats accept the Trumpian narrative that if we only speak about politics on Trump's terms, we win, then the war has already been lost. July is winding down, but there's still time to check out this wonderful campaign called Hashtag Two Pads a Day. It aims to introduce podcast listeners to two independent podcasts each and every day for the entire month of July. Hot Star Podcast was one of the featured podcasts earlier this month for Independence Day. But the campaign continues, and I encourage you to check it out to listen to and follow some other great indie podcasts. Follow on Twitter at Two Pods a Day so you can be introduced to cool indie podcasts daily in your Twitter feed. Hashtag two pods a day encourages you to listen more, listen indie. We can't say that the Trump Russia investigation is a nothing burger anymore, but is the evangelical church compromised as well? Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. 1 John 2, 15-17 In the world, but not of the world. Back when I was an evangelical in college and grad school, I heard this phrase in many a sermon and a lot of Bible studies. I'm pretty sure that when I helped co-lead a campus Bible study in college, I used the phrase myself. Yet here in 2018, many of the top evangelical leaders who wield a great deal of influence over many evangelical Christians have placed Donald Trump in their thirst for power over the word of God. They are of the world for sure and ready to take their earthly thrones. Evangelist Franklin Graham, the son of late Reverend Billy Graham, said of Bill Clinton's affair with Monica Lewinsky back in the 90s that Clinton's sins are not private. But in 2018, he sings a different tune regarding dear leader Trump and the alleged cover-up of affairs, Stormy Daniels, and a taped discussion with attorney Michael Cohen regarding hush money being paid to another former mistress. About Stormy, he says, it's nobody's business. About the hush money, Graham tweeted about it, and this is what he said. Quote, Everyone in the media is talking about the just-released tape and what the president said or didn't say what he meant or didn't mean. It is a good moment to point out that everyone should realize that every word that is spoken or thought is recorded by God. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. We won't be judged by media spin masters or forensic audio analysts, but you will be judged by truth and righteousness, 
by God himself. Have you ever thought about what his verdict would be on your words? Here's a sober warning from God's word. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. Luke 12, 3. Unquote. So it's essentially using the Bible to threaten people for holding Trump to account for sin. And to rationalize his double standard, he said, quote, The difference is what happened with Bill Clinton, he did this while he was in office, and that's the difference. These alleged affairs, they're alleged with Trump, didn't happen while he was in office. This happened 11, 12, 13, 14 years ago. And so I think there's a big difference, unquote. The problem with that excuse is that, number one, Trump has not repented of these misdeeds. Remember, he has said he has no need for forgiveness. And number two, and this is especially important for the sake of the comparison, Trump was allegedly paying these women off during a 2016 presidential campaign, not 11, 12, 13, 14 years ago. And sin doesn't magically go away with the passage of time. Never read that in my Bible. If it worked like that in Christian doctrine, there would have been no need for Jesus' sacrifice on the cross because we could all just wait out our sin. If it worked like that in Christian doctrine, there would be no need for Jesus' sacrifice on the cross because we could just all wait out our sin. And how about Paula White, televangelist and Trump's spiritual advisor? When asked about family separation in the treatment of refugees from Central and South America seeking asylum in the U.S., she says, quote, I think so many people have taken biblical scriptures out of context on this to say stuff like, well, Jesus was a refugee. Yes, he did live in Egypt for three and a half years, but it was not illegal. If he had broken the law, then he would have been sinful and he would not have been our Messiah, unquote. Besides the fact that Jesus was a child when he and his family fled to Egypt, there are three problems with this. First, the Bible doesn't distinguish between undocumented and documented, legal or illegal immigration. Secondly, asylum seeking is not illegal. The problem is that the Trump administration has not only separated families, but have told asylum seekers to drop these claims and they will get their kids back, essentially extorting confessions to lawbreaking out of them so they can once again see their children. Thirdly, White is alluding to Romans 13, which calls early Christians to respect authority, but lawbreaking is not necessarily sin. In the epistles, Jesus is referred to as sinless, but at the same time, according to the Gospels, he was taken in, tried before the Sanhedrin, convicted for a crime against the Roman Empire, and executed by the Empire by crucifixion. Check out the August bonus episode where I'll talk more about why using Romans 13 to justify Trump's atrocities is problematic to say the least. Donate to the Flying Machine Network's Patreon at patreon.com slash flying machine at the $5 pilot level so you can check that out, as well as the bonus episodes of all the Flying Machine Network podcasts. But yes, Jesus broke the law, yet he was sinless. But hey, this is also the same televangelist who told her congregation back in January to give up to a month's pay to her ministry at the beginning of the year as first fruits, or else they would incur consequences. Then let's look at Robert Jeffress pastor of the First Baptist Church of Dallas, and another one of Trump's spiritual advisors. Quote, I think the president is willing to sit down with the Democrats and negotiate a way to protect our country and, at the same time, keep families together. I believe the scenes of children being separated from their parents. Those pictures are gut-wrenching. Equally gut-wrenching is thinking about the child that was Kate Steinle, who was murdered by an illegal immigrant being separated forever from her parents. I think there has to be a balance here, unquote. Kate Steinle was a 32-year-old Caucasian woman who was killed in San Francisco back in 2015 after being hit with a stray bullet from the gun of undocumented immigrant Jose Inez Garcia Zarate. Zarate was acquitted of murder and manslaughter 
but convicted of being a felon in possession of a firearm. Stiley's death has been a cause celebre for ultra-conservatives and white nationalists who are pushing the narrative that undocumented immigrants, or immigrants in general, pose a clear and present danger to Americans, particularly white Americans. The death of Steinle was extremely tragic and should never have happened. But the fact is that the vast majority of killings are committed by those who look just like ourselves. Most crime in general is perpetrated within one's own race or ethnic group. In addition, undocumented immigrants commit fewer crimes than American citizens born here. Documented immigrants even less. The idea that a man of the cloth professing Christ is exploiting Kate Steinle's death to downplay and condone the separation of children from their parents, the criminalization of asylum-seeking, affecting families who have come here to escape death from gangs and the illegal drug trade, and extortion by the Trump administration, all of which are a violation of how we are called to treat strangers, is misleading the flock. And according to the Bible, leading your congregation astray matters. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. Jeremiah 23, 1 and 2 Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. James 3, 1 A moral relativist America, sponsored by our own Ministry of Truth, has apparently infiltrated the church too, especially evangelical leadership and those they influence. Do these preachers, these ministers, these evangelists truly believe in the Christ they preach about to their congregations and other Christians who look up to them? It makes me wonder if they truly fear God. Lately, I've been listening to a podcast called Mind Shift Podcast. The host is a PhD and former pastor who left evangelicalism and began to deconstruct his Christian faith. In his episodes, He conducts interviews with other people who have left evangelicalism and are in different places spiritually. It has really made me think, but I think more than that, it's a process. I've talked in previous episodes a lot about my issues with evangelicalism. In episode 24, I talk about my personal and academic background in evangelical Christianity and what made me question it. At the time, I saw myself as more estranged from evangelicalism than an exvangelical. But if I'm truly honest with myself, I think it's because it's hard to let go of something that has been a major part of my life for a long time. It's like realizing that a bad relationship isn't going to work out, but you put so much of yourself into it that it's so hard to let go. But at some point, you have to cut the cord and rebuild. And while I am a Christian and I still believe in Jesus of the Bible, I can no longer say I'm evangelical. 81% of white evangelical Christians voted for Donald Trump, and they are still his strongest supporters. But so much of what Trump says and does is against what the Bible says, which should be important to this group who tends to view the Bible as the inerrant word of God. Sometimes I wonder if Trump supporters who are also evangelical have a moment of clarity when they question what it has cost them and the faith to throw their support behind someone like Donald Trump. How many struggle with being honest with themselves too? What will it take for Trump Christians to hashtag walk away, either from the Republican Party or from evangelicalism? I recently read something that gave me a glimmer of hope. Just a glimmer. I alluded to in previous episodes that when I first became a Christian, I attended World Harvest Church, an evangelical megachurch right outside Columbus, Ohio, whose pastor, televangelist Rod Parsley, has made no secret of his political conservatism. Abortion is the only thing that matters, except when it's not. 
But I read something posted on the website for his political lobby group, the Center for Moral Clarity, that gave me a tiny bit of hope. There were Parsley's anti-abortion pronouncements, his anti-contraception stance, and celebration of voter suppression in the form of voter ID laws that disproportionately affect the poor and minorities, a sizable percentage of which attend his church and make him rich. But among all that was a note that was published right after the 2016 presidential election and Donald Trump's win. Parsley was actually one of the few televangelist pastors who was slow to endorse Donald Trump, even after he received the Republican nomination. Now, in this post-election statement, the center did say that they preferred Trump to the alternative, stating, quote, For values voters, Trump's victory represents a chance to dramatically improve public policy concerning its most important issues, including life, religious liberties, and the temperament of the federal judiciary. The Trump administration and the 115th Congress will surely be more sympathetic to the interests of values voters than the administration of Hillary Clinton would have been, unquote. But then after outlining how Trump would be better, in their view, for what they call values voters, they go on to say this, quote, At the same time, we believe the church, and especially its leaders who spent relational and political capital on the election of Mr. Trump, need to do an internal integrity check and repent before God where necessary. The November 8th election resulted in possibly the best possible outcome for the church, but has surely come at a cost. The undeniable truth is that a broad array of Christian leaders worked tirelessly for the election of an unrepentant serial adulterer who has bragged openly about sexual harassment, building an empire from the gambling industry, and unjust business practices with employees and vendors. That Mr. Trump won the election does little, if anything, to mitigate what people inside and outside the church have called hypocrisy on the part of its leaders. The damage done to our witness is unknowable, but it would be naive to think the church won't pay the price for its striving after political power. We've burned some bridges in our congregations and among those we've charged with reaching the gospel, and it's clear we will need to rebuild those bridges. We understand that many believers reluctantly supported Mr. Trump out of a belief that the alternative to his election was unacceptable, and we agree that Trump's election precluded the prospect of four dark years for values voters. But we can't escape the nagging notion that some of our leaders had made the church's primary task more difficult in the months and years ahead. The church's mission is not to be politically powerful or even welcome in political circles. It's to make disciples. Our prayer going forward as we advocate for righteousness in the public square is that we will remain mindful that our primary goal is to win souls for the kingdom. Unquote. It's the closest statement I've seen from the conservative evangelical sphere to displaying any level of self-awareness or responsibility for the damage done to the reputation of American evangelicalism for the compromise for the sake of political power and social dominance. Yet for much of American evangelicalism, there is a level of cognitive dissonance one must live with to accept the deal with the devil the church has made with the powers and principalities in our modern world. When will the cost be too high to endure the lies any longer? I definitely recommend that you check out one of the other excellent podcasts on the Flying Machine Network, Stranger Still, hosted by Nick Wood and John Began. They're all about answering the questions you never thought to ask. Nick and John are fun to listen to, and there's always something new to learn in each episode. My favorite ones so far are their episodes on Mormons and on multi-level marketing. Yes, those are separate episodes, though in a way, those could go together if you know anything about Mormons and MLMs. But their episodes are all great to listen to. And check out the most recent episode of Stranger Still, where Nick and John talk about how technology works with language. And just think, what a predictive text filled in our conversations. So yes, check out Stranger Still on the Flying Machine Network, flyingmachine.network slash strangerstill, or their own website, strangerstillshow.com. 
Stranger Still is on iTunes, Stitcher, and any of your favorite podcatchers. Thanks so much for listening to Pot Stirrer Podcast. If you enjoyed the podcast, subscribe on iTunes or subscribe on Android. Go to potstirrerpodcast.com slash download, and the links are right there. If you subscribe, you can get new episodes once they drop, so you don't have to wait. Be sure to tell your friends about the show, and if you have any suggestions for other topics or want to discuss your thoughts on an episode, go to the Pot Stirrer Podcast Facebook page at facebook.com slash Podcast. I'm Jay Poole. Let's fight for America's future because freedom is not free. I give you the incredible flying machine.